uh, I've been at Pluralsight, um, just context here, uh, for about four and a half years. Um, and before that was in, in management consulting. Um, so let's, ju let's jump to the next slide here. It, it, and I wanted to um, maybe ground people in what I see as uh, critical and can't start, you can't even build a forecast process unless you have this stuff happening. Um, it, you know, you can, you can have a beautiful process, but if you don't have a, uh, you know, clean data, it, it doesn't matter what process you, you run that, that dirty data through, you're not going to get an act. So to me, the number number one is define sales process. You know, if you're in stage one or stage five, what does that mean? Um, what what are the entry and exit criteria for each of the stages? Is there consistency within your sales organization around having deals at specific um, uh, sales stages? And once you start having that, you can start understanding win rates at this stage, what, what are the conversion rates, the pass-through conversion rates uh, across the different um, uh, stages. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two on data quality is, you know, if, if you're trying to forecast for this quarter, for next quarter, uh, re really hard to understand which opportunities are should be included or shouldn't be included if the close dates are wrong quarter if it's hey that's a million dollar deal versus actually it's a five hundred thousand dollar deal um you you have to have the the rigor around the the really critical crm data um that uh is easy to i think overlook or or not have sort of up to date um the third piece is define forecast roles and parameters so what do i what do i mean by that um what i mean is you have to understand it for each uh, individual rep, for for a first line leader, uh, for a VP, for an SVP. What is the role that they're playing in the forecast? Um, and uh, addition to that, you know, we have different. We often have stages, but we also have forecast categories. Um, and you know, so we use commit, expected, best case. What does that mean? What what is expected? What is commit? What is what is best case? And defining all of those things so that it's clear and then enabling on it is, is critical. And then the last thing is, um, and at least mentioned this, deal reviews and, and inspection. Um, if you have a bunch of pipeline that is not being inspected on a regular basis, my guess is, uh, it sort of goes back to my first point, you won't have good quality data and therefore you won't be able to forecast. And so to me, those four things, like if you if you don't have those four or they're not uh, pretty robust, like start there because all, all you talk about won't be useful. It won't generate a, a good outcome from a forecast perspective. Um, so let's maybe jump to the next slide here. So um, in terms of where to start and, and how to start, um, the thing I would say first is start simple. It, it is really easy for us uh, in the roles that we that we play to to want to add a lot of complexity. There's so much nuance to forecasting. Um, at least talked about some of that, like geo and um, different segments and uh, different. They, they you, you could forecast by channel and by geo, and and all of that's awesome. And you'll never get the thing off the, this process off the ground unless you start really simple. And what I would say is it, it's it's a way for you to to start get, gaining some traction, and then you can add complexity as you go. And I think we've um, you know we've been able to adopt something similar, where it was a process to begin with, and we've been able to beef it up over time. And and I think um, it's easier to, to gain momentum and see progress and have people understand what you're trying to accomplish. And you, you'll get more people to, to align to that. Um, th the second bullet here uh, is, is not in any particular order here, but the it, it is so critical that everyone buys into the process. Um, at Pluralsight, we forecast on a weekly basis. So we forecast what the current quarter uh, will end at. And, and then towards the end of the quarter, we actually start forecasting the next quarter as well. And um, uh, if there is not buy-in at a senior level, 
uh, my guess is you may start this process and build out the process and it may work for a month or two, but then when it starts to get hard and things get busy and there's integrations or there's other things that are happening, you will likely start uh, seeing drop off from uh, in your in your forecast process. There has to be from all the senior revenue leaders, the executive team, that this is one of, if not the most important exercise on a weekly basis and have commitment to that. And, and then those people will lead their teams uh, to that as well. Um, third bullet here um, that we uh, have done at Pluralsight, and I think it's, it's been useful for us which is, you know, we, we talk a lot about building forecast models for the sales team to run, and uh, and that's very useful. And what I would say is, it's also useful to have uh, your own. And and the reason why is you can start to triangulate where there's issues or or where you actually see differences. And I think it's helped uh, us have kind of two separate perspectives on what the model or what, what, what the forecast uh, is likely to be, given that we can look at the sort of bottoms up build from the sales side and maybe a tops down uh, uh, data science uh, model or ensemble model um, in, in, ter in terms of, uh, you know, not, not really using this, the sales driven uh, methodology. Um, and then maybe the last thing here is something uh, that's an, I would say not a must have, but a nice to have, which is um, being able to track your forecast and who is calling what at what point in the quarter can allow you to understand who's, uh, who's just a hedger and will always hedge. And, and so you can either coach them not to hedge or you can actually account for them always hedging or vice versa. There's someone that's always super aggressive and um and and isn't quite uh you know it can't quite because they they're they're optimistic they think every deal is going to close it, it's it's helpful to sort of be able to tune those things and, and as long as you're capturing that data on a weekly or monthly basis i think it'll it's useful to be able to go back and um and and reference that in the future maybe the the Let's jump to the next slide here. Um, and this is a, a little bit illustrative. Well, not a little bit, it is illustrative. Um, I think there's, uh, there's um, you know, you could spend a lot of time forecasting, a lot of time. Um, and, and you think about big organizations and you have multiple lay layers of, of reps and then leadership. And, you know, there is a lot of time on a weekly basis that's spent on forecasting. And the, the point of, of this chart here, where you have time and effort on the X axis and then your accurate Y axis is, at some point there's a break, right? Where it's, uh, you know, incremental time and effort doesn't actually get you that much more forecast accuracy. And I don't know where that, like what that looks like specifically or, or, or where it needs to be for, for any given company. But I, but I think it's worth, um, spending some time thinking about how accurately really need this to be you know if you're if you're a, a series a company that um uh is uh sort of needs to be plus or minus 30 percent and and you know funding keeps going you know that's probably all all the time you need to spend on forecasting if you're a public company and and order, um you know bookings will determine stock price it, it probably needs to be within 5%, right? And and so I think um, j just spending a little bit of time thinking about where are you and, and how much time can you spend, um, I, I think will we'll, uh, create dividends for you. Um, one of the things here that we've tried to do, uh, and there's always more that we could go do, is to try and automate as much as you can. Like my goal uh, as a as a ops leader is to really minimize the amount of time people have to spend forecasting. Like they they are going to generate more value for the, if they're spending time with customers. And so I want to do as much as I can to to create you know one pane of glass so to speak for them to be able to just kind of see 
everything that uh, they need in order to, to create an accurate forecast, do the forecast and then get back to customers. And I think often we, we uh, um, easy to, to, to add lots of requirements, add lots of complexity and, and have them spend way more time forecasting than, than maybe um, is, is useful. And then the last thing uh, is just, look, we, um, it's easy to set a process and then let it run and forget about it. One of the things that is useful is going back periodically and saying, what's working, what's not working and, uh, and, and tweaking it over time. Um, and uh, hopefully that both improves the forecast and reduces the amount of time that's actually, that actually takes to, to generate a forecast. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, one of the things that came to mind for me is you were talking a lot about layering on complexities, starting simple, um, and also reviewing and optimizing, which is super important. But what are some signals either from your team or the sales team that make you go, okay, we're ready to add on more complexity, or maybe we need to scale this back? Yeah, it, when we start, uh, when we actually start feeling complacent and say, hey, I, th there's actually not a lot that I need to do. Uh, from a fork to, to either generate the forecast. Um, uh, to me, that says it's, there's probably time for us to actually start thinking about what are the what, what are the next add to the model. Um, in, in terms of when have we gone too far, I think it's uh, I think it's it's feedback from the sales team, uh, frankly. And I think you, you got to you got to balance that one and understand you know. Where's the feedback coming from? Is it a, you know, we, we made the change at end of quarter, and so it's a it's a point problem right now. But once we move into the new quarter, they'll find about it. Um, is it just something new? So I think it's a little bit of sensing, like how is our team feeling about the process, and if we're if we're steady state, we can add more. If the sales team is giving us feedback to say this is too much, you know, what well, we we can we can pull back. Um, I think, you know, there there is also nothing to do from a forecasting process perspective that we aren't working hand in hand with those senior sales leaders on. And so we work with them and, and, and they're the ones that help sort of build out that forecast process or changes to that forecast process. And they will, they will provide the feedback then before we even roll it out that, Hey, this is going to be too complex, too much right now. Oh, you know, Hey, let, let, let's, let's move ahead with it.